have to make a confession. I'm not really a CSS person. So what am I doing here? I come from the font world, and I want to explain how that links in to how it relates to, to the world here. So this is how typography used to be in the olden days. We had type foundries on the left. They made fonts out of lead. We have typographers who understood how to use this, printers who made final products for readers. Typographer and printer sometimes were the same person. They always were in the early days. Then they separated. Desktop publishing area, things changed a bit. We had our font makers. Um, these were digital type foundries, we sometimes call them. We had the designer, designing things for readers. The printer sort of went into the, into the background. We didn't really need to think about that, the, print, the printer too much. Now it's come back again, though. The person implementing the final product really talks to the designer a lot. Font makers, still the same place. End users, they've replaced readers. Um, I'm from this world on the left, so we need to talk not just to the typography guys, to, but to the CSS wizards, to, to this crowd as well. And so I want you to understand why I think this is the most exciting time in typography for over 20 years. I want to first mention four eras of web typography. For, on the left, before 96, let's call that prehistory. After 96, we had uh, sorry, that's prehistoric. So type on the web, 96 to 2010, we have Microsoft's core fonts for the web. This was a great initiative by Microsoft. It gave us 10 type families. Wow. That you could rely on, you could pretty much rely on them being in all, on all the computers. Five of them for text, five families. In 2010, the web catches up. Web fonts, uh, that's the syntax on the left, you know well. On the right, some, uh, the, the command line tools to build the fonts and some suppliers and, and companies that will offer you web fonts. That's great, and it allowed you to, books like this to be published. Web typography is a real thing for the first time. Bandwidth, hmm. network requests, if you want several fonts on a page. There are some downsides, which in 2016 were addressed in a really significant way. What happened at the ATAPI conference in Warsaw uh, just over a year ago, Monotype, Adobe, Apple, and Google came together and presented this, the OpenType Specification 1.8. And the thing that everyone's really excited about that's in it is variable fonts. But before I talk about that, I want to go back a bit and talk about the type family. What is a type family? That's a simple type family. Roman, italic, bold, and bold italic. More often, though, type foundries, the really interesting ones, are releasing things like this. This is Tofino. I got a tweet about this just a couple of days ago. New family with 74 fonts. So if you buy into this family, you've got a really big palette of stuff to choose from. You can use it for lots of stuff in your, in your, in your layouts. This is uh, Sharp Grotesque. Uh, 259 fonts. Now, that number starts to get a little bit scary. How do you install 259 fonts? What the hell? Uh, Dropbox used it in their recent branding uh, redesign. Um, and they're using all those different uh, widths to look at the type on the bottom left there, how it's, as the, as the browser gets narrower, it's swapping out to a narrower type, really responsive type. Cool stuff. It's not yet variable, though. So how, does it, how, how can we make things, things variable? I'm going to look at a typeface called Winner. This is the default weight of Winner in the middle there, the letter B. I'm going to add what we call a weight axis to it. And what that means is adding two extra master designs. So the regular we regard as the first master. The, on the left, we have the super thin master. On the right, we have the super fat, the black master. We assign those positions on this so-called axis. All the gray Bs you see in between, they're automatically generated by linear interpolation. So you just store these three masters in the typeface. And then you name. You give these things in the middle names. The thin has weight 200. The light has 360. The regular 500. The, seven, the bold 750. And the black 930. So these ones you, you put into the font. The black lets use the 930 value. And again, it's automatically interp interpolated. Then let's think about adding a width axis to the same font. So from the same master outline, same regular, we add a super narrow at the top. We have give that zero on the width axis. Super wide, we give it a thousand. Combine them, we get this. 
the axes combine together their effects. So you see the, we get a super bold, super wide on the right, super narrow, super thin on the left. Uh, we can add more masters to fine tune. You see on the top right there, the, 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 the counters in the B have closed up. We can add a new master there. Uh, we can add as many masters as we like. Just showing you how the, he, the designer has chosen some points in a two-dimensional space now to specify his um, weights, as they, as the widths as they get wider. So this is what we're doing. This is our terminology in the font world. We're interpolating between master designs in a multi-dimensional design space. I just showed you a two-dimensional space. If you're from the animation world, I think maybe you'd like, maybe prefer these words, tweening between keyframes, but in a multi-dimensional design space, not just one dimension time, multi-dimensional. How many? We talk about axes. How many axes can we have? Quite a lot. Two to the power of 16. Um, but they're small, don't worry about this. They're very small things. That's the one of the main reasons the companies are behind them. We only have five outlines stored in this font, and those four green ones are just stored by their offsets from the points as defined in the, in the regular. So these things are super small. They're even smaller because we use key points to define these things. On the right, we see how you might imagine the B is defined from regular to bold, as you see the green arrows show the movement of each point. On the left is how we can actually define that in the font. We only move the points that have to move. The points in between get to come along for the ride. So it's only moving 14 points out of around 30. So that's half the size you might think it would be. We then use WAF2 compression. This is the super compression using an algorithm called Broately. Uh, if you're not using WAF2 compression on your fonts, you really ought to be. Uh, these fonts are super small. So where can we play? When this uh, technology was announced, I didn't have anywhere to play with them. So I wrote one. I wrote something called Axis Praxis. How many have used Axis Praxis in the room? Can I see a show of hands? OK. I would love you all to try it out. Give you a little live demo here. This is what the page looks like. Uh, you can, this is a, so a specimen. I've divided the, the whole the Axis Praxis into specimens. So here we have. Uh, Lots of variable fonts used. We can use this slider to mess around with the axes. I'm using a weight axis there on the Zeitung font, optical size axis. This, uh, let's increase the width of the Gimlet font there. This one's rather fun. This is, uh, <laughs> this is from the Zycon font, which was actually designed uh, in the mid 90s. This technology is uh, actually a revival of an, of an Apple technology. Um, lots of cool stuff there. So uh, let's see what that one does. Ah, that's nice. Same, same font, because icon font. Uh, this fit typeface has this incredible uh, ar array of um, its width axis. So it goes from super wide to super thin. Wow, look at that. Uh, this, is just, this is just one font used for all of those things. Um, after I launched Access Practice, I was really delighted that people started sending me fonts uh, because I, I had a drag and drop option on it. So people could drag their fonts from the desktop. This is be font developers dragging it from the desktop onto this area here. And they could play with their own fonts. It wouldn't upload them to my website. It was just for testing. So I've got some uh, uh, nice uh, fonts on the left here. There's a Chinese one. Chinese are really interested in this because uh, well, a whole of CJK, the Far East, because of uh, the effect on font size. Here we have, there we are. Uh, what shall I show you now? Buffalo Gal. That's a fun cowboy one. Some of the effects are rather subtle, so I, I wrote a CSS loop to uh, zoom in on some of these things. There we are, just using a transform scale. Um, let's show Dunbar is rather nice. Has an X height axis as well as uh, weight, which you know what weight does. Uh, there's Fit that I showed you before. But feel free to play with these. They're all on accesspraxis.org. Uh, there's the Zycon font, all this cool stuff. Uh, it even does some rotation. Now, the mathematically alert of you will know that you can't do rotation with linear interpolation, so you have to do it in steps. But it looks really cool if you do, let's say, I think these have 12 steps for these rotations, and that's fine. 
Uh, the grade typeface is pretty cool. This is really s for subtler effects. Can you look at the text block on the left, how it's getting thinner, then darker, without reflow. Now, this is a, could be really good in response to, let's say, ambient light sensors, deciding how, um, how you want to display your type, without, again, without reflow. Uh, I'll take you a bit about around the UI. There's the, I've shown you the loop. This play pause button is for uh, animations that are associated, associated with each specimen. That's coming very soon. Uh, the instances uh, panel there is that shows all the instances that are predefined in the font. Again, these take up no extra space or a couple of bytes each. They're really useful though. The CSS button there, that shows you the CSS you need. Can you see it changing? there as I drag the slider. Um, there's a playground with some other little experiments. And there's a drag and drop if you're a font developer to, um, to drop to test your own fonts. New text box, delete text box, that's for editing uh, this, this environment. And then using that arrow there, you can save these, uh, these specimens to share them. Then you get a URL that is uploaded that, that and you, can, you can share them with your friends. Um, OK, let's go. Back. I just had this week. I just had loads more fonts just in. I wanted to show you. This is a uh, Clifford from Monotype, one of my favourite typefaces. This has an optical size axis, so this is used for use at large sizes. This is for use at small sizes. We can do cool stuff with that. So you see, uh, just there, you see how the queue is closing up. We have a breakpoint where it flips to another glyph, so another set of interpolations. Uh, some French ones now. Vestebro by Black Foundry. Spectral from production type. And this one I like, Mineral from Thomas Marchand. And this one, again, very, very new, hot off the press. This is a, this looks amazing in if you put some nice coloring and, and glow on it. It's just incredible. And just this morning, uh, Lucas Sharp sent me the variable test version of the font I just showed you being used in that Dropbox branding. So they're work everyone's working on this stuff. Uh, Alana Munro, who's um, Tofino I showed as well, she's working on, on one as well. Uh, we can do stuff like this. FTW, for us, it means fit to width. <laughs> this is uh, Trois Mille, again, by a French designer. Uh, the, the idea of this interface is it shows you how we can choose axis settings depending on the aspect ratio of the text box. It's the corners are going red when it goes too narrow for the font to know, and then it switches to a simple transform. We go blue when it goes over. Um, we can also adjust the weight, and then it, which would normally expand the typeface, but we can say, no, use the width axis to bring it back in. How do we control variable fonts? First of all, with CSS, font variation settings is the fundamental one. You will hear people saying, oh, no, don't use this. It's too low level. I really encourage you to try it out because it's fun. That's the main thing. That's uh, how we do it, font variation settings. Then a list of the axes. Weight, 394. Width, 95. Uh, We've got registered axes, five of them. The reason for registered axes is so we can have them predictable. We want to know what happens when we choose 600 on a bold scale. It will be around semi-bold. Um, optical size is actually implemented in, the Safari, in Safari, so it will actually automatically change your font's optical size um, if it has an optical size axis. Uh, there, for example, there's the bold, there's the font weight uh, property showing how it's defined. 400 is defined with a Normal, 700 is defined as bold, and then we can use any floating point value between one and 1,000. So that is the same as font variation settings, weight, 394. Dynamic control with JavaScript. There's the vanilla JavaScript at the top, jQuery underneath. Again, that's the same string, the weight 300 there, just as we saw in CSS. Without JavaScript, uh, transitions, it works with transitions. So just as I click the next now, that was set with a two second transition, it's flipped. Animations are more powerful. We, we set up our animations, they work out, they work with the settings in, in font variation settings as well. 
we can also use uh, Leia Veru's Mavo to do some even cooler stuff using the inter in using uh, axes using uh, sliders r input ranges to control things. Again, this uses no JavaScript and it uses and it's playing with ten axes. Uh, so how do we control these things? Well, with two axis fonts, it's we can imagine it's pretty easy. These this is Gingham and Dunbar. This is from these are screenshots from Axis Praxis. With 10, 12 axes, it gets a bit of a mess, and axis names start overlapping, so we're not really sure about interface for these things. If we have a simple two-axis font, again, this could be a, this simple thing here I showed you for winner could be a, a, an idea. And in fact, it has been used, this kind of two-axis, two this two-dimensional space. This is Superpolator, a, a tool that font developers use. Uh, three dimensions. Uh, type uh, his, to historians and type uh, education, educators uh, come up with these diagrams. I put it into an animation uh, a few months ago. Um, not everyone likes it. Uh, this is uh, I'm going to be sick for those who don't speak French. Uh, another, another idea. So we're playing around with ideas here. This is uh, just so you can get them all in a small space. But we really, we'd love to have your ideas for interaction. We're, we're not great, we're not interface designers, you, you are. Um, browser support, that's can I use. As you see, Chrome <laughs> is great. So, but come on, Chrome is great, Safari is great. Uh, Chrome, so Chrome on all platforms, including Android. Firefox has some flags, so you can try it in Firefox, but just switch on some flags. Edge is coming really, really soon. This is a tweet this week again from Greg Whitworth on the Edge team. Uh, Fullback. Well, that's uh, cool. That's using two TTFs. That's uh, this is old-style web de web development. This is with variable. So this is using one TTF in the font face, and then we're using two definitions for font variation settings for our regular and our bold. We use the supports directive to check whether font variation settings are supported. Then we can do one set of CSS if it's supported, another if it's not. That's the one where it's not supported. We go back to the bringing two TTFs down. Can we polyfill it? Well, I wrote one, and it works really amazingly well. It's really quick. JavaScript is, uh, so this is the variation spec implemented in JavaScript, downloaded with a small JavaScript file. You bring in the variable font, and it's not quite as, as fast, but it's, I think it could be usable. It's not quite ready, but um, could, it could be, could be used. So let's uh, put all this stuff together. What do we get? Let's try a single axis font with some keyframes. Anyone know this guy? He took these photographs around 1880. So I digitized them in glyphs. 16 frames. That's all in the same glyph, I must say. These are layers of the same glyph. Here's some HTML that animates them. So I just use the HTML animation property. That's bringing in the WAF2. There's the time zero, time 15. And here's the final animation thing. The body is just an emoji horse. And we get this. And this is how big the font is. 3,900 bytes, plus the 300 or so bytes of the HTML. This is, I don't know if there's a smaller way to produce that animation. Uh, then I had some fun. Let's add some more components. Uh, add the new color tables that Microsoft defined a couple of years ago. And we get this. At, um, this took about 200 extra bytes, the color data. It is, it's virtually nothing. We've barely scratched the surface, though. This is all, some stuff I've come up with. We want, you, we want your ideas. We're, we're from the font world. We're not interface builders. We're not typographers, even. You are. So let's collaborate. Thank you very much.